everything that personified jazz, really. Thank you very much indeed, Monty. Thank you. And the best of luck. Thank you. you. Can I start first of all, Lonnie, by bidding you welcome to Germany? Thank you very much. For what, the umpteenth time? Um, I think it's the, uh, the third time in the last uh, 18 months. Yeah, we, <coughs> we came over, first of all, we got a, an invitation from uh, an agent in Hamburg to come over and do some concerts which completely mystified us because we haven't been in Germany. We've only been in Germany once before and that was about 1958. We only did two concerts, one in Hamburg, one in Berlin, that was it. We've never been before or since. So when I got this call for a tour of concerts, I, you know, mystified me, but what the hell, we came over. And uh, we did, you know, surprisingly, well, I didn't quite understand it until I realized that they had a big skiffle scene here in Germany, which uh, is probably the only place in the world Probably the only place in the world where they uh, they have a skiffle scene. They don't even have one in England now, you know. No. Um, and we toured with a skiffle group, a German skiffle group called Leinemann, who were very good. And we came back again, did another tour, and then Leinemann said, hey, why don't we make an album? And uh, so we did. Uh, and it was turned out very, very well. I was very surprised. So we've come back this time to uh, exploit the album, you know, go around with Leinemann. Uh, we're doing, I think, 12 concerts and uh, television and and in Vienna. And uh, we've nearly finished now, and so far it's been fantastic. You know, everybody's been full and reception's been marvellous. So it looks like we're made the permanent scene for ourselves in Germany, hopefully. Why has Skiffle taken so long to reach Germany? I don't think it has taken so long to reach Germany. It stayed in Germany. It seems to have stayed the, the course, you know, which is surprising, uh, because it's a, a medium with really... Uh, very restricted medium, you know. Yeah. Uh, basically, because it, it it depends entirely on folk material. I mean, the the the, the sort of definitive uh, uh, skiffle is a folk song with jazz influence. Okay, so if you accept that, then you say then all skiffle songs have to be basically a folk song. Once you've said that, you've limited the whole field because once you've used up all the good folk songs. There's nothing left. You can't sit down and write one. It's not a folk song. <laughs> True. So well, that's people are doing it. Well, yes, they are doing. Not very successfully. Though. But so that, that this is primarily what brought brought it to a close in England because I just I just ran out of good sort of uh, up tempo singable folk songs that I could work on. Um, so it's really a mystery to me because over here, of course, I don't understand the lyrics anyway. True. You know. Um, well, except in certain areas. I, I would say that guardedly, actually. Um, I was at a concert in our area, in Goodislow, mm -hmm. by an Irish folk group, Planksteen. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. And they introduced every song. And they got reaction all the time. They cracked jokes, they got reactions. Well, this is one of the calendar. This is strange. And um, the boys in Lineman told me this. They said, well, you know, talk to the people, tell some jokes. I said, what are you talking about? How am I going to tell jokes in German? They said, no, do it in English, because Planksteen did it. And uh, I can't understand this, because I have tried a couple of wisecracks in English. Um, it's mostly met with a blank stare. So the only thing I can conclude from that is that either Planksteen drew a very large English section into the audience, or they weren't talking English. <laughs> Um, neither. Neither. The only thing they did was slow the delivery down. They found it a bit awkward mm. because when you're trying to speak very, very slowly, you're inclined to lose track of your That's, thoughts. Yeah, and you're this was the one thing with, uh, that made their act suffer just a little bit, it was the speech side of it. But they slowed the delivery down and got their reactions. So instead of 50 words the minute, mm. they slowed down to 40 words mm. and That's got the message across. That's very interesting. It really is. I because uh, it would open a whole new world to me if I could yes. do gags, you know. Uh, well, I'll certainly, I'll certainly give that some uh, some thought and try a few sort of simple, basic ones and see, see what happens. But um, getting back to the skiffle bit, I really can't ask you why it's, it stayed here for like 18, 20 years. I don't know why. 
But they do have uh, skiffle groups here, and uh, semi-professional, if not professional, you know. And they seem to have flourished the whole time. They sell skiffle albums, skiffle records, and so on. And we're well, wherever we play, we uh, we're obliged to play the old hits not even new material. If we introduce new material, even though we think it's very good, you know, and we, we play it well to our satisfaction on stage, the audience reaction is mediocre. Whereas if we play some of the old things, no matter how badly we play them, the, the reaction is uproarious. So uh, it's still a mystery to me. I still don't know quite what we're doing here. <laughs> I'll work it out. As long as, as long as they come, that's the main well, thing. Well, that's the main thing, yes. And it would be nice if you knew what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you came to the fore in the, uh, the early days of Skiffle way back in the Mm. Way back, way before yesterday. Um, what brought you into Skiffle, or did you bring Skiffle into yeah, well, Britain as you were credited with doing? Yeah, there was no such a thing as Skiffle, it still isn't really. It was just a name we applied to what we were doing, that's all. How did you arrive at the word Skiffle? It was a word um, uh, used, a uh, sort of semi ethnic term used in the 30s by Negroes around the sort of mid Chicago area. Um, slightly scatological in the same way that uh, the word jazz originally was a little scatological and, and ethnic and it had you know sexual overtones I think skiffle was a, that, that same ambiguous sexy word <laughs> yeah, have a skiffle or whatever you know it doesn't seem very uh, sexy in this day and not now no no that used also I mean uh, uh, blood and zounds doesn't sound very epithetical either now but there were swear words in their day you know <laughs> um, You've come a long way since then. From St. Louis, yeah. Um, you started off, presumably you started off in Scotland originally playing. No, 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 no. I, have, I was born in Glasgow, but we left here when I was about two or three. Oh, as early as that? Yeah, and I was brought up in London, basically. Oh, that's, so, that's where you came to lose your accent, though. You didn't gain yeah, one. No, I never had one the first time. I can put it on, though, and I won't. <laughs> um, so wh where did you learn your music, then? In London or yes. in the States afterwards? No, in London. Uh, from records. Beautiful records. In, in the first place, yes. What type of records? Folk music and jazz. That was from I was 14, you know. And then I went professional when I was... Uh, I came out of the army, did two years in the army. I was in Vienna for a year. It was the 8th Army. And then um, I came out of the army in 50. No, so I tell a lie. 50 or 51, gee, I can't remember now. 50 or 51. And we went professional about 53. I'm an amateur jazz band from about 51 to 53. And then uh, we went professional, formed the Chris Barber band. Yeah. Monty, Chris, myself, Ken Collier. Uh, well, originally it was called the Ken Collier Band. And then uh, we were, I was with the band for three years. And then we made the first album, uh, which included the track Rock Island Line. And that was released, became a big hit. And I left and I went to the States on my own. So Rock Island Line was before you went to the States? Yes. Oh, rumour has it that you went to the States, found Rock Island no, no, Line... No, 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 no. Other way around. came back to Ken Collier and... No, the other way around. We made Rock Island Line first. That was a big hit in the States. And that's why I got asked to go to the States. Do you see? How are you accepted in the States? Oh, very well. I still go there now, you know. I still work in the States. Yeah, initially, though, an Englishman coming over to... Oh, yeah, they didn't quite know what it was all about. They looked at me and their jaws dropped open. Yeah. Half of them, like, when you have to go around the disc jockeys and say hi and uh, play my record and things, uh, they were all shattered because they'd expected a big Negro to walk in singing Rock Island Line, you know. So this little warped Irish Scots Hillbilly walked in. They said, how are you doing? What do you send you for? Where's Lonnie Dunning? You know. <laughs> but, um... I got over that eventually. Did you have any problems being accepted? No. Uh, the Americans are very open uh, when it comes to uh, show business. They say, well, I prefer to work in America more than anywhere else because they sit there, they say, right, you're an entertainer, entertain me, let's see what you can do. And they'll give you help all the way because uh, they want to be entertained. It's not a challenge match no. like it can be in England, you know. They don't say, right, with bear with money. Bloody Mac Miller. Go on, if you can. Go on, go on. See if you can Mac Miller. Hey, I'll shoot him down. Go on. But it's not like that in America. I say, hey, baby, let's have some laughs. It was a different attitude altogether. You've been doing rock on a line and chewing gum. And Man and boy. <laughs> song 20 years now. Oh, God. I still don't know the words. How often do you get fed up doing them? 
Every night. <laughs> um, I'm just, before you go on stage, you say, oh God, I've got to do Rock on a Line again. But there comes a point, presumably after the first line or the first verse, when you think, oh great, this is it again. Sometimes, sometimes not, to be quite accurate. Uh, there are times when, you know, you're in a mood, times when you're not in a mood, you know, the same as anybody in the world. I mean, you get up in the morning, you feel good, you get up in the morning, you feel bad. Same as the person who goes to work, sits down at his office, says, oh, Christ, I've got to do this typewriter again, you know. I get the same thing, I walk on the stage, oh, jeez, here we go again. Come on, fella, smile, for God's sake, smile, you know. How often have you said, I'm not doing the old hits again? Oh, dozens of times. Dozens of times. I've reformed the act, you know, and gone out and tried to force new material and... Uh, very frustrating. This is why I like to go abroad so much because only when I'm out of England can I uh, revitalize my act and recharge my batteries and remember what show business is all about. You know, in England I'm just sort of a walk down memory lane for the majority of the people. Yeah, this bothers you. Oh yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's good living, but it's it's no uh, no career. No. So in order to become good at my profession, I've got to go to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, America, and now Germany. Is is it? It's a walk down a walk down memory lane here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is before the door leading into memory lane. <laughs> yes. Well, one of the things you don't get uh, credit for is your, your songwriting. Uh, the, the one big song, above all. Never fall in love. You never fall in love. Yeah. Not enough people know that you wrote yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, it's well. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because uh, and another thing is in England, uh, once again, majority of people don't care. Funnily enough, they they. They give no credit to songwriters or writers of any kind, in no. fact. Um, not that they give much credit to performers on the whole. We're still sort of court jesters in England, you know, looked down on as lower caste. Um, but in America or Canada, anyway, you know, if I say, I wrote Never Fall in Love Again, they go, wow, and everybody stands up and applauds, you know. But over here they say, well, so what? So I wrote the song. Our friend writes songs every Saturday night when it comes on from pub. Don't you say that song? Oh, bloody great they are. So, I mean, it's all amateur time in, in England, you know. It's a country of amateurs, I'm afraid. You think so? As far as showbiz is concerned, yes, definitely. As soon as anybody in England raises themselves to a professional standard, in showbiz I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, they immediately lose popularity and become whipping boys, both for the press and for the public. True. But uh, the approach, though, is not amateur. Uh, I mean, people like Tom Jones and Shirley Bassey. Yes, but in order to become Tom Jones and Shirley Bassey, they have to leave England. So well, what's wrong with our system, then? That well, because it's a land that loves amateurism. Even in sport, same thing applies, doesn't it? That's true. Right? I mean, we, we have... Uh, look at the, the, the money we pay our footballers compared to the money that footballers can get here. Never mind the money they can get in America. Right? England loves a talented amateur. And they like to, they like to what's the word? Um, uh, hmm, the word's gone. They like to feel a, a connection with the person yes. that they're watching, whether it's in sport or, or on the stage. They, like, they don't like to feel that the person they're watching is a better man than they are. Yeah. They won't concede that, no. ever. Right. Not even if it's proven to them. They'll turn their back on the proof and walk away and say, well, we didn't like him anyway. <laughs> yeah, if you're up on stage, you must be slightly bent or something. Uh, yes, so that. that they can laugh at you and deride you. Or they must love you as one of them. Yeah. I.e. Gracie Fields. Right. I mean, for instance, if Gracie Fields had ever spoken in a cultured accent, they would have crucified her. I mean, undoubtedly, I'd burn her at the stake, you know. But didn't you achieve this kind of popularity? Yes. Oh, yes. We, uh, but, well, when I was, you know, in the early days, when I was uh, uh, one of the lads from the the, the, uh, the jazz club pub down the corner, you know, I mean, I was adulated by the local lads, you know. But when I learnt my trade, and I became skilled at being a professional entertainer, right, the the resentment set in. And, oh yes, I'm, I've many times been criticised be, as being too professional sometimes, but mostly I'm called too American. Which, of course, is a flattery to me. That, that's understandable, I think. But at the time that you achieved stardom, 
I picked Lois thought of you as being one of the boys. Well, I was one of them. I was one of the boys. I was one of the boys. You can't be one of the boys, you know, when you start. You can't have both. I, I thought you achieved it. Only in the interim period, when you're on the ascendancy. But there reaches a point of no return. Once you've had three or four hits. Well, it's not a question of record hits, it's a question of professionalism. Once you learn how to clean your shoes and put on your makeup, which side of the stage to walk on from, you know, how to set your lights, what to tell the musical director, how to turn your face to the royal box, etc., 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 which makes you a professional, yeah. so that you can walk on dying of the flu, right, and still look as though you've got up fresh and sparkling and you can't wait to sing this next song. That's a professional, see. Does the man in the street know this? Of course he, he does. It? Not a bit. No, no. What do you do during the day then? I mean, for your real job, you know. That's the British attitude. You're not being a bit cynical now, are you? Or are you? Well, what I'm telling you is, I mean, you're asking me questions, I'm giving you my frank answer, right? Uh, I'm not given to hypocrisy. I don't like hypocrites. Never have done. If I had done, I'd be the biggest time I was today. But uh, there you are. So, uh, spade is a spade. You know me? And uh, you ask me a question, I'll give you my answer. So, what countries give you the best reactions then? Um, America and Canada. America and Canada, how about the continentals? Well, they give a good reception, oh, an enormous reception here. Uh, but it's not discriminating because I feel that they don't really know what the hell I'm doing anyway. See? Just another act. So, not question. They, they like it, they like what they're watching, but they don't know why or what it's about. So, although it's nice to get a good reaction, obviously, since that's why I'm there, it's nicer to get a good reaction from people that you know, understand what you're trying to do, and say, hey, that boy is really doing it. Yeah. Then you feel you've achieved something. Well, getting back to the achievement of songwriting. It's the same as saying being a, a painter. You know, I mean, you can make a painting that becomes immensely popular and you sell millions of prints all over the world, you know, to butchers, bakers and candlestick makers who want to brighten up their wallpaper. Now, you're very glad they like it, but you wish it was painters that liked it. Yes. You know what I mean? So if you can also get it hung in the National Gallery, now you've won. Yeah, I follow, I follow. We're going to get back to songwriting. Um, you had a big success with Fall in Love again. Uh, have you had any other successes? Um, not, uh, I've had, I've written other songs which I've sung myself, which were big successes like Mama's a Dustman and Have a yep. drink, drink on Me and a few others like that. And some of those have been done here by other groups and been very successful here. Oh. Um, funnily enough, I met a chap last night from a group here called The Lords, mm -hmm. who uh, were very big here for many years and did uh, about four of my numbers, I think three of them were compositions. And I did very successful with those. I've only heard one of those songs that was Ancient Sweet. They seem to specialise in English songs. Do they? Yes. Oh, I don't really know them that well. I, I know their royalties, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got royalties coming in from those songs anyway? Oh, yes. In fact, I earn more. I have a publishing company in England. And I earn more money annually from the publishing company than I do from performances. Really? Uh-huh. Well, I've No, it's very nice. I mean, because... Uh, that goes on into your old age, you know. Yes. <laughs> Which is fast approaching. Do you do much composing? No, I don't. I, I don't count myself as a composer. Occasionally I get the odd little idea and, uh, you know, I try it out. Uh, I've just got a new song, actually. We've got a new album, which as I mentioned we did with Lineman called yeah. Lonnie Donegan Meets Lineman. Tell your friends and book early to avoid disappointment. And I've got a composition on that uh, called Tops at Loving You, which is I, I like. It's, it's not a great song, but it's, it's cute, you know. And that's the kind of thing, you know, about maybe twice a year I'll get an idea. But I'm not a writer. I'm not a professional writer. If you told me, sit down, I want two songs about this and that, I couldn't do it. That's a writer, you know? Yeah. What kind of material are you doing nowadays, apart from the old hits? Well, in, um, in Canada, for instance, which is probably a place we get most reception, I... Oh, just working on the, the single. Oh, I was going to get to the single. 
Yeah, you now when we play, for instance, in, in Canada or somewhere where we're not tied down to doing anything specific, then I, I, I veer towards, I think, what you call modern country, like Chris Christopherson, Gordon Lightfoot, John Harry Denver. Nelson, John Denver, yes, these kind of things. This is what I enjoy singing at the moment. Oh. But and, you and show tunes. I like to do, you know, production numbers where I can dance and so on. You gear your, your act, though, to the country you appear in, do you? No, 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 no. I am a singer of American folk songs. That is my reason for being. You know, this is how I've always uh, been ever since I was you know, 14. Um, and my act is based around that, that sound. You know, but I also bring in other things as well. But basically, I'm a, a very broadly speaking, a country singer. Country come folk singer. Yeah. But you have, over recent years, become very show businessy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any particular reason for that? Is that. Yeah, I love show business. <laughs> no, it's not just a way of putting across your, your versatility and getting people to bring you into other aspects of show yeah. business. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, all this, all these things, yeah. You really had to sell Lonnie Dunnigan? Not, not, in, not in those words, I am going to sell myself. No, I only do what I enjoy doing, you know, and I love show, uh, show business, I love to dance, I love to do gags, you know. And uh, when I walk on the stage, I like to do all these things. You, you do such a, a cross-section of, Complete, of show business. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I try to, anyway. Yeah. I often wonder who, you, who you're aiming at. Nobody. Nobody in particular? No, nope, nobody at all. As many as you can? Yeah, just whatever I like to do, you know. Uh, and it was not wishing to sound too egotistical, it was all that the performers were egotistical, otherwise they couldn't get on the stage and say, hey, look at me, right? Quite, quite. <laughs> um, I like to do that. I say, you know, I like to, this is me. This is what I like. Hey, listen to this. I like this one. I hope you will too. Yeah. You know. And then people look and listen. They say, well, I don't like his taste. I'll go see Des O'Connor. Well, that's their choice. But it's no good saying, well, wait a minute, I'll sing some of Des O'Connor's ones. Well, that's, that's stupid, you know. You, you are somebody or you're nobody. Yeah. How hard do you work at your acts? Very hard. Uh, Harder than most people I know. Uh, how, how much preparation goes into Lots. any evening? Lots. Like, like this evening? Lots. We, we rehearsed when we arrived in Germany. We rehearsed for three days. And we rehearsed the following day as well. And we rehearsed once more after that. So we've rehearsed five days for a ten, uh, 12 concert tour. Is it different of coming on the... Oh, yes. Then for oh, the yes, of course. And also, it, it, not merely short-range, but long-range, too. I mean, uh, if one is moderately successful, then one has a market than one didn't have before, both for records and concerts. And the more markets you have open to you, obviously, the, the better business you're doing. If you weren't in show business, what would you do? Cry. Uh, what kind of trade do you think you might follow? Now or in the beginning? Well, in the beginning. Obviously. In the beginning, I'd like to have been a footballer. A footballer? Yeah. Um, and those are the only two things I've got any talent for, singing and playing football. What team do you support? Manchester United. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Silly question. <laughs> Man's <laughs> four. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, somebody who comes to Scotland at a very early age and goes mm. to live in London could only support Manchester United. <laughs> there's some logic like, there, some... <laughs> I know them all personally, that's why. How did you come to pick on the United? Well, first of all, I, you know, it's a natural process of selection. If you like football, um, you had to watch Brazil, Hungary, England, or United. Yeah. I mean, watching people like Georgie Best and Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law, these are the greats of, sh of uh, football. You've got to watch. And if you love football, you've got to love them. So you are naturally attracted to United, and then I had the good fortune to meet them, which you know uh, clinched the whole thing. Now I go whenever I can, you know, all, all over the place to see United. You um, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> There must be somewhere that you kind of, you like to go to United though, for some specific reason. I mean, Tottenham were just as famous in those early days. Um, no, not really. They didn't have uh, the players United had. Did you not have it all then? 
Well, they had the cream, yeah. They had the, the glamour and the skill and, and of course, the success of the first team in, in England to win the European Cup. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's going on in my mind again. Yes, the show business 11. You play occasionally for them, don't you? Yes, uh, very much so in the early days. Uh, less and less so now. Not because I don't want to, but because it's more difficult to get together. You know, uh, In the early days when we were in theatres and you were a week at a time and you were touring with a company or you went to summer season for a long time, then you really had time to, to form a team. Um, and also you knew well ahead where you were going to be, but these days with the clubs and and uh, concerts and things, it's much more difficult. It's ah. not, not through lack of the inclination to play. How many concerts do you do a year? Oh, well, it's On impossible average. to make a guess. You know, uh, some years a lot, some years none at all, you know. The basic, um, basic bread and butter is, is nightclubs, of course, all over the world. Between your, your nightclubs and your concerts and tours and panto and what have you, uh, obviously you take holidays. Yeah. Uh, how much of a holiday do you fly? Well, last year, year I took five months because <laughs> <laughs> I felt I needed it and I wanted it down with them. <laughs> but this year, I, I don't know, I think um, probably only have a few weeks this year because uh, I think this is a skinny year to take holidays in. I think, I think this is going to be a tight year all round for everybody. For everybody, yeah. yes. How have the past 20 years affected you as a, a person? Oh, how can I say that? I can't answer that. You say, how has your life affected you as your life? You know, I don't know. The last 20 years has been my whole life, really. But you, you've hit the top. Uh, uh, I must say, you've come down a bit, obviously. I mean, a person who's not having hit records is not constantly in the line. Yes, but yes, you're still right. up there as one of the, the top acts. Um, does it put a strain on you? Oh, yeah. Having to be uh, a top cat all the time? Yeah. Well, it's not so bad now, uh, but in the, in the, you know, in those, those days with the hit records, it was dreadful. It was awful. I mean, you just had no life at all. You, know, you could, couldn't even sneak into the pictures with a pair of dark glasses or anything. You know, couldn't go out to restaurants. It was just like being a prisoner. You know, it, was, well, it wasn't worth it. It really wasn't. Wouldn't do it again. You know, wouldn't have it again. But it's not the same anymore. No. Now, it's a much more friendly basis now because people... People see me in the street now and say, Hey, Lum, so last night on the telly, it's good, yeah. Whereas previously they'd go, Hey! And they form a crowd and a posse and tear tufts out of your hair, you know. Do you still have to watch yourself, to watch your behaviour in public and all this kind of thing? Oh, it's yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're on, you're on view. Sure. Does it, does it worry you that I have to? Not really, no. I think uh, I'm a much more mature person now, obviously, so... I don't, uh, not given to public misbehaviour anyway. <laughs> How long do you see yourself continuing in the business? Long as the business will have me. I wouldn't have it any other way. Right. One, one way or another. Going on stage though? <clears throat> don't know. Impossible to say. Uh, in its present form, oh, not more than five years. But um, who knows? Who can say which way the road will take you? What would you do after you leave the, the, the stage side of it? I don't know, I might go into production or something, but uh, it's really, I, w I wouldn't, you know, insult you by hazarding such a wild guess. I don't know whether you had any kind of preconceived no, ideas. No, I don't, no. Plans for going into television or something on those lines. No, no. Um, have you ever thought much about acting? Yes, yes, oh yes. Um, oh. Oh, three minutes. I'm right. thinking right now about doing me act myself. No, I'll just be off and sing a few songs. Right, thank you very much, Lonnie. My pleasure.